كرمته وشرفته وفضلته على الشهور وهو شهر الذي فرضت صيامه عليه وهو شهر رمضان الذي أنزلت فيه القرآن هدى للناس وبينات من الهدى والفرقان وجعلت فيه ليلة الكاد وجعلتها خيرا من ألف شهر فيا ذا المني ولا يمن عليه من علي بفكاك ركبتي من النار في من تمن علي وأدخلني الجنة برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد اللهم رب شهر رمضان الذي أنزلت فيه القرآن وافترضت على إبادك فيه الصيام سلي على محمد وآل محمد وارزقني حج بيتك الهرام في آم هذا وفي كل آم واغفر لي تلك الذنوب الإذان فإنه لا يغفرها غيرك يا رحمن يا ألام بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد اللهم إني عفتته الثناء بحمدك وأنت مسدد للصواب بمنك وإن كنت عنك عن ترحم الراحمين في موضع العفو والرحمة وأشد المعاكبين في موضع الإنكال والنكمة وأعظم المتجبرين في موضع الكبرياء والعظمة اللهم أذنت لي في دعائك ومسألتك فاسمع يا سميع مدحتي وأجب يا رحيم دعوتي وأكل يا غفور أسرتي فكم يا إلهي من قربة قد فرجتها وهموم قد كشفتها وأثرة قد أكلتها ورحمة قد نشرتها وهل كتب لا إن قد فككتها الحمد لله الذي لم يتخ الصاحبة ولا ولدا ولم يكن له شريك في الملك ولم يكن له ولي من الظل وكبره تكبيرا الحمد لله بجميع محامده كلها على جميع نعمه كلها الحمد لله الذي لا مضاد له في ملكه ولا منازع له في أمره الحمد لله الذي لا شريك له في خلقه ولا شبيه له في عظمته الحمد لله فاشي في الخلق أمره وحمده الظاهر بالكرم مجده الباسط بالجود يدا الذي لا تنقص خزائنه ولا تزيده كسرة العطاء إلا جود وكرم إنه هو العزيز الوحاب اللهم إني أسألك كليلا من كثير مع حاجة بي عليه عظيما وغناك عنه كديم وهو إندي كثير وهو عليك سهل يسير اللهم إنا أفك عن ذنبه وتجاوزك عن خطيئتي وصفحك عن ظلمي وسترك على كبيه عملي 
وهلمك عن كثير جرمي عندما كان من خطعي وعمدي أتمعني في أن أسألك ما لا أستوجبه منك الذي رزقتني من رحمتك وأريتني من قدرتك وأرفتني من إجابتك فصرت عدؤك آمنا وأسألك مستعنسا لا خائف ولا وجلا مدلا عليك فيما كسدت فيه إليك فإن أبتر عني عتبت بجهلي عليك ولعل الذي أبتر عني هو خير لي لإلمك بعاكبة الغمور فلم أرى مولا كريما أصبر على عبد اللعيم منك عليه يا ربي إنك تدعوني فعولي عنك وتتهبب إلي فأتبغض إليك وتتودد إلي فلا أقبل منك كأن لي تتول عليك ولم يمنعك ذلك من الرحمة لي والإحسان إليك والتفضل إلي بجودك وكرمك فارحم عبدك الجاهل وجد عليه بفضل إحسانك إنك جواد كريم الحمد لله مالك الملك مجري الفلك مصخر الرياح فالك العصبة ديان الدين رب العالمين الحمد لله على هلمه بعد علمه والحمد لله على عفوه بعد قدرته والحمد لله على طول عناته في غضبه وهو قادر على ما يريد الحمد لله خالق الخلق باسط الرزق فالك العصبة في الجلال والإكرام والفضل والإنعام الذي بعود فلا يرى وكرب فشهد النجوى تبارك وتعالى الحمد لله الذي ليس له مناذ يعادله ولا شبيه يشاكله ولا ذهير يعاذله كهرب إذة العزة وتواضع لعظمته العظماء فبلغ بقدرته ما يشاء الحمد لله الذي يجيبني هنا عنادي ويستر علي كل عورة وعناء أسي ويعظم النعمة علي فلا أجازي فكم من موهبة حنيئة قد أعطاني وعظيمة مخوفة قد كفاني وبحجة منكة قد أراني فأثني عليه حامدا وأذكره مصبها الحمد لله الذي لا يهتك هجابه ولا يخلك بابه ولا يرد السائل ولا يخيب عامله الحمد لله الذي يؤمن الخائفين وينجي الصالحين ويرفع المستضعفين ويضع المستكبرين ويهلك ملوكا ويستقلف آخرين والحمد لله كاسم الجبارين مبير الظالمين مدرك الحاربين نكال الظالمين صريخ المستصرخين موضع حاجات الطالبين معتمد المؤمنين الحمد لله الذي من خشيته ترأد السماء وسكانها وترجف الأرض وأمارها وتموج البهار وما يسبه في غمراتها الحمد لله الذي حدانا لهذا وما كنا لنحتدي لولا أن حدان الله الحمد لله الذي يخلق ولم يخلق ويرزق ولا يرزق ويطعم ولا يطعم ويميت الأحياء ويحيي الموتى وهو هي لا يموت بيده الخير وهو على كل شيء قدير 
اللهم صل على محمد عبدك ورسولك وعمينك وصفيك وحبيبك وخيرتك من خلقك وحافظ سرك ومبلغ رسالاتك أفزلا وحسنا وأجملا وأكمل وأتما وعن وأذكى وعنما وأتيبا وأدحر وأثنى وأكثر ما سليت وباركت وترحمت وتهننت وسلمت على أحد من عبادك وأنبيائك ورسلك وصفوتك وأحل وأحل الكرامة عليك من خلق من خلقك اللهم وصل على علي أمير المؤمنين ووسير رسول رب العالمين أبدك ووليك وأخير رسولك وهجتك على خلقك وآيتك الكبرى والنبأ العظيم وصل على صديقة الطاهرة فاتمة الزحراء سيدة نساء العالمين وصل على سبت الرحمة وإمام الهدى الحسن والحسين سيد الشباب أحل الجنة وصل على عائمة المسلمين علي بن الحسين ومحمد بن علي وجعفر بن محمد وموسى بن جعفر وعلي بن موسى ومحمد بن علي علي بن محمد والحسن بن علي والخلف الحادي المحدي حجتك, حجتك على عبادك وأمنائك في بلادك صلوات كثيرة دائما اللهم وصل على ولي أمرك القائم معمل والأدل المنتظر ووفه بملائكتك المقربين وأيده بروح القدس يا رب العالمين اللهم الأ... اللهم اجعل الهداية إلى كتابك والقائم بدينك استقلف في الأرض كما استقلفت الذين من قبله ما كله دينه الذي ما كله دينه الذي ذرتذيته لا أبدله من بعد خوفه عمنا يعبدك لا يشرك بك شيئا اللهم أعزه وأعزز به وانصره وانتصر به وانصره نصرا عزيزا وافتح له فتح يسيرا واجعل له من لدنك سلطانا نسيرا اللهم اظهر به دينك وسنة نبيك حتى لا يستكفي بشيء من الحق مخافة أحد من الخلق اللهم إنا نرغب إليك في دولة كريمة تؤذ بح الإسلام وأحلا وتذل بح النفاق وأحلا وتجعلنا فيها من الدعاة إلى طاعتك والقادة إلى سبيلك وترزقنا بها كرامة الدنيا والآخرة اللهم ما عرفتنا من الحق فحملنا وما كثرنا عنه فبلغنا اللهم اللهم المن به شعثنا واشعب به صدعنا وارتك به فتكنا وكثر به كلتنا وعزز به ذلتنا وأكن به عائلنا وكذبه عن مغرمنا واجبر به فقرنا وسد به خلتنا ويسر به أسرنا وبيذ به وجوحنا وفك به عصرنا وأنجح به طلبتنا وأنجز به موائدنا واستجب به دعوتنا 
وأعتنا به سعلنا وبلغنا به من الدنيا والآخرة عمالنا وأعتنا به فوق رغبتنا يا خير المسؤولين وأوسع المؤتين اشف به صدورنا وأذهب به غيث قلوبنا وأحدنا به لما اختلف فيه من الحق بإذنك إنك تحدي من تشاء إلى صراط مستقيم وانصرنا به على عدوك وعدونا إله الحق آمين اللهم إنا نشكو إليك فكت نبينا صلواتك عليه وآله وغيبة ولينا وقصرة عدونا وكلة عددنا وشدة الفسن بنا وتظاهر الزمان علينا فصل على محمد وآله وعنا على ذلك بفتح منك تعجله وبذر تكشفه ونصر تعزه وسلطان حق تظهره ورحمة منك تجلل ناها وآفية منك تلبس ناها برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد اللهم برحمتك في الصالحين فأدخلنا وفي إليين فارفعنا وبكأس من مئين من أين سل سبيل فسكنا ومن الهور الإين برحمتك فزوجنا ومن الولدان المخلدين كأنهم لؤلؤ مكنون فأخدمنا ومن ثمار الجنة ولهم التير فأتئمنا ومن ثياب السندس والحرير والحرير والإستبرك فألبسنا وليلة القاد وهج بيتك الحرام وكتلا في سبيلك فوفق لنا وسالح الدعاء والمسألة فاستجب لنا وإذا جمعت الأولين والآخرين يوم القيامة فالحمنا وبراءة من النار فاكتب لنا وفي جهنم فلا تغلنا وفي عذابك وحوانك فلا تبتلنا ومن الزكوم والضريء فلا تطعمنا وما الشياتين فلا تجعلنا وفي النار على وجوهنا فلا تقببنا ومن ثياب النار وصرابيل القطران فلا تلبسنا ومن كل سوء يا لا إله إلا أنت بهك لا إله إلا أنت فنجنا بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد اللهم إني أسألك أن تجعل فيما تقضي وتكدر من الأمر المحتوم في الأمر الحكيم من القضاء الذي لا يرد ولا يبدل أن تكتبني من حجاج بيتك الحرام المبرور هجهم المشكور سعيهم المغفور ذنوبهم المكفر عن سيئاتهم وأن تجعل فيما تقضي وتكدر أن تتيل عمري في خير وآفية وتوسع في رزقي وتجعلني ممن تنتصر به لدينك ولا تستبدل بخيري أعوذ بجلال وجهك الكريم أن ينقضي عني شهر رمضان أو يطلع الفج من ليلة حاذي ولك كبلي تبعة أو ضنب تعذبني عليه
بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم إني أفتتي حسن بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد اللهم أدخل على أهل الكبور السرور اللهم أغني كل فكير اللهم أشب كل جائع اللهم أكس كل أريان اللهم أكدينا كل مدين اللهم فرج عن كل مكروب اللهم رد كل غريب اللهم فك كل عسير اللهم أسلي كل فاسد من أمور المسلمين اللهم أشف كل مريض اللهم سد فقرنا بغناك اللهم غير سوء وخلنا بحسن حالك اللهم اكد أن الدين وأغننا من الفخر إنك على كل شيء قدير رحم الله من يقرأ الفاتحة محمد وآل محمد صلوات بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Monday 18th March 2024 Eve of 8th Mahe Ramadan 1445 Kindly keep your mobile phones on silent during the program Always keep your belongings with you at all times Tomorrow Tuesday 19th March Zohrain program will start at 12 noon with Masails by Maulana Sayyid Kalbi Abbas followed by Jamaat Salat at 12.14 p.m. Children's afternoon program will run from 4 p.m. to 5.30 p.m. during weekdays. Main evening program will start at 7.45 with Darsa, followed by Duas and lecture by Sheikh Muhammad Al-Hilli. Full details of my Ramadan program is on the website. CPV announcement. Kindly leave your keys in the car at all times, even if your car is not blocking any car. Please park your car starting from the rear of the car park and not from the front row. Small Business Showcase will be running for the fourth, third time on Saturday, 23rd March. Further details on our website. Al-Hadi Youth, Thursday, 21st March, Al-Hadi Youth and after Maghrib, Al-Hadi Al -Hadi Youth and After Maghrib will host a live podcast entitled Blindly Following the Religion of Our Parents. This will commence in the ELC after the main program and it is open to all. Friday 22nd March, annual Gents Barbecue after the program. Limited tickets are available. Please reserve yours early to avoid disappointment. Tickets available online and at the Treasury Desk. The Quran Academy announces a part two of Tafsir series entitled The Secrets of Talking to Allah by Sheikh Muhammad Zamin Ali Dina. These will take place on Thursday 28th March and Sunday 6th of April at Hujjat Stanmore. For more information on timings and signing up, please see the website. Darul Quran Wal Itra is pleased to announce Quran recitation classes for ages 5 to 7 years old girls and boys and 8 to 10 year old girls starting from Tuesday 16th April from 5 to 6 p.m. at Hujjat Stanmore. To register please go on Hujjat website and fill the form. These classes are for new students only. Our green team message cut waste cut costs bring your own plates cups and cutlery to save the planet and unthawab this Mahi Ramadan. Raffle tickets are for sale with some excellent prizes. Please see the treasurer's desk for more details. Mahi Ramadan Tabarruk and Iftar Fund is now open. Please speak to Brother Sajad Tejani, Nasima Bai Karim, or the Jamaat office you would like to sponsor or part sponsor. 
Kindly donate generously for Hujat Stanmore refurbishment at the Treasury Desk or online at www.hujat.org. Uh, Surah Fatiha is requested for Kul Aruhail Mu'mineen wal Mu'minat Al Fatiha. I would like to invite Brother Ali Bandali for a short talk. Please welcome him with the Nare Salwat. Audhu Billahi Minash Shaitanir Rajeem, Bismillah Rahman Rahim. My elders, scholars, brothers and sisters, Assalamu Alaikum Warahmatullahi Wabarakatuh. قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم طلب العلم فريضة على كل مسلم ومسلمة which means seeking of knowledge is obligatory on every Muslim male and female for those of us who went to Mombasa Ali by Panju Jaffrey Primary School APJPS as we lovingly used to call it, this inscription was in the hall on top of the, the stage, for those of us who remember. Um, and it has inspired uh, many students, including myself. As the coordinator of uh, WFZCSS, whenever I get the opportunity to visit sponsored students and address them, I try and convey a simple message to them, something I heard from an educator and a friend. And, and just to clarify, I'm not on a fundraising mission on behalf of ZCSS, I'm just saying. The message is this. For an average lifespan of 75 years, we will spend a maximum of a third, which is 25 years, in education, which is the first 25 years. Now, how well you do in the next 50 years depends on how hard and how well you have done, how hard you worked and how well you have done in the first 25 years. So if you qualified well, acquired the right life uh, skills, you will have a good career and relatively easy working life, right? I also emphasize that in the first 25 years, you have your childhood and all that. So seriously, for an academic student, if he wants to qualify, he has to work hard two years GCSE, two years A-levels, three years to five years university. Okay, maximum seven, nine years. Serious studying if he does it. By and large, he will be set for the rest of his life, right? Now, there are exceptions to, to every rule, and uh, as a general rule, uh, it stands true. Interestingly, I found that this also works later on in life, right? If you're serious about learning something and you give it the dedication and attention, then you can have a very successful career change even late in life. And we have numerous examples of people who have done that very, very successfully. Furthermore, education is intricately linked to spirituality for us especially the Shias. It is not simply about acquiring worldly knowledge, but also seeking a deeper understanding of the divine. Through the pursuit of knowledge, through the pursuit of knowledge even, individuals embark on a journey of self-discovery and self-improvement, drawing closer to God and attaining spiritual fulfillment. In conclusion, I go back to the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wasallam. Who could have said that he is the city of mercy? He could have said that I am the city of kindness or even wisdom or worship. Who is a greater worshiper than the Holy Prophet? But no, what did he choose to say? He said, I am the city of knowledge and Ali is the gate. Nara, Haydari. Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad Salawat.
Asant Ali. Let us all welcome Sheikh Muhammad Al Hilli with a loud salawat. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله مالك الملك مجري الفلك مسخر الرياح فالق الإسباح ديان الدين رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف خلقه وخاتم أنبيائه وسيد رسله سيدنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع ذنوبنا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المطهرين المكرمين قال الله العظيم في كتابه الكريم وهو أحسن القائلين وأصدق الصادقين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا لا تخونوا الله والرسول وتخونوا أماناتكم وأنتم تعلمون أمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم for the purification of the souls, the enlightenment of the hearts, the acceptance of the deeds and for the hastening of the reappearance of the awaited Savior عجل الله تعالى فرجه الشريف enlighten your souls and the atmosphere with the recitation of salawat upon Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad Respected elders, sisters and brothers, Salaamun Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi Ta'ala wa Barakatuh. <clears throat> Who is the most beloved human being or an individual or a being to you at this current moment? And if that particular being were to tell you that there are a number of things that are beloved to me, and a number of things that I dislike, would we endeavor to provide those aspects that that being likes and stay away from that which, of course, is disliked? What is fascinating is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Holy Quran has specifically referred to certain groups of people that he says, I like and a group of people that he has said, I dislike. There is no doubt, generally speaking, those who worship Allah, Jalla wa Ala, are obedient to his commands, fulfill the obligations and stay away from that which is forbidden, are liked by Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yet, at the same time, he says there are groups of people specifically that I like. Inna Allah yuhibbu. And there are ayat that says, Inna Allah la yuhibbu. Eight groups of people specifically mentioned in the Quran in which Allah says, I love them specifically. Nine groups of people specifically mentioned in the Quran that Allah says, I do not like them. Inna Allah la yuhibbu. How many times in the Quran you've come across these ayat and you've wondered when Allah loves a group of people, what does that mean? Is that based on emotion? Because when we love somebody, we show them compassion, empathy, we smile at them, shower them with presents and gifts, visit them, speak fondly of them. Allah Jalla wa Ala, when He says, I dislike a group of people, what does that mean? There is no doubt, there is no more devastating impact than when Rabbul Alameen says, I dislike a group of people. Because he, indeed, is our creator and he loves all of his creation. Yet there are certain of his creation that he has singled out that he dislikes. Out of these nine, there are those whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has referred to as Zalimeen. Inna Allah la yuhibbu Zalimeen. There are also those who are al-kafirin. Inna Allah la yuhibbu al-kafirin. There is also the polytheist, mushrikeen. Yet, a group of individuals who are seldom discussed 
and are mentioned three times in the Quran specifically where Allah says, I don't like them. A subject of critical importance is where the Quran says, In Allah la yuhibbul khainin. Allah does not like those who commit betrayal or treason. This is a very important subject because there are countless narrations and before that ayat that speak about the concept of khiyana, betrayal and treason. And it is considered to be a critical discussion within the school of Ahl al-Bayt and within the religion of Islam. Because when you look at the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala immediately gives us stories of betrayal. The first thing that came to your mind perhaps now when the word khiyana was used is where an individual, for example, lets someone else down as far as marital relationships are concerned. Or in a financial agreement of somebody is with someone in an agreement and the other person runs away with the money. They've betrayed them. The Quran comes forward, however, and gives us an interesting story in chapter 66 in which the betrayal is presented from a different angle. Allah says, ضَرَبَ اللَّهُ مَثَلًا لِلَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا امْرَأَةَ نُوحٍ وَامْرَأَةَ لُوطٍ Parable, similitude is given to the disbelievers of two wives of the prophets. Prophet Nuh's wife and Prophet Lut's wife. كَانَتَ تَحْتَ عَبْدَيْنِ مِنْ عِبَادِنَا صَالِحِينَ They were wives to two righteous of our servants. فَخَانَتَاهُمَا They committed khiyana. Now, today, there are some individuals in the United Kingdom and in London who call themselves Shia and they have their own movement and whatever. I'm not going to give them any oxygen of publicity. But they are advocates against the consensus of Muslim, Sunni, and Shia ulama. They've come forward and said, this khiyana, this betrayal, treason of the two wives of Prophet Nuh and Lut is based on extramarital affairs. That they had relationship with other men whilst being married to the Prophet. Ulama, Sunni and Shia have denounced this. They have said this is not possible for a wife of any of the prophets to ever commit a relationship outside marriage because we have established reports and narrations from the Ahlul Bayt like the one from the Holy Prophet Rasul Al-A'zam Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Wasallam. Ma baghat imra'atu nabiyyin qat the wife of a prophet has never committed treachery or treason which involves being in a relationship, physical relationship, which is what? Outside marriage. Yet, when it comes to the world of narrations, the idea of betrayal is presented in the actions of these two individuals. What do we find? Nuh's wife would disclose secrets of her husband to the enemies. Lut's wife, what did she do when she saw those angels that came in the form of males? She immediately went and informed the committee, the, the committee community of, of Sodom and Gomorrah, in order to tell them that there are people you should come and demand that they're given to you. Quran says this is khiyana. This is the manifestation of what? The greatest manifestation of treason and betrayal. That's why the narrations of the Ahl al-Bayt have come down hard on this spiritual vice. Meaning what? Meaning the Holy Prophet of Islam has said, لَيْسَ minna مَنْ خَانَ muslima." If you ever betray or commit treason against a Muslim, you're not one of us. Amir al-Mu'mineen wa Imam al-Muttaqeen Ali ibn Abi Talib sallallahu wa sallamu alayhi. In a famous narration, he says, Al khiyana tu ra'sun nifaq. That betrayal and treason is the pinnacle of hypocrisy. The recognition that emerges is what? There is a sahih hadith from the Holy Prophet, Rasul al A'zam Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That is a very important hadith which is critical for you and I because sometimes we think these vices, these sins, are committed by people who do not practice faith. 
we think that it doesn't involve me. Alhamdulillah, I pray, I fast, I go for ziyara, I go hajj, I go umrah. This idea of khiyana does not apply to me. This hadith is very important. The Prophet says, Thalatha, man kunna fihi kana munafiqa. If you have these three things, you are a hypocrite from bottom to top. Number one, when they are entrusted with something, they betray the trust. Number two, when they speak, they lie. And number three, when they promise, they break their promises. The recognition that is so important for us to understand is there is what is known as the social betrayal. al khianatul ijtima'iyya. And in my humble small research of discussions that go on around in society, in books, in lectures, it is not discussed sufficiently. And hence, unfortunately, as a result of the development of technology today, arguably it's being displayed at the highest level. This social betrayal has a number of levels. Please understand, so that we can explain Quranically what is it that, God forbid, we are doing which the riwayat and the ayat have condemned heavily. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-An'am, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, la takhoonu Allah wa rasul Oh, you who believe, do not ever think about betraying Allah and His Messenger. Ulama say the first level of betrayal and khiyana is when I blatantly disregard the commands of Allah and deliberately go against it. Imam Ja'far ibn Muhammad al-Sadiq sallallahu wa sallam alayhi. Cites this story. The story is the reason why this ayah was revealed, which is what? This famous individual by the name of Abi Lubaba. Some of you have been blessed to go to Masjid al-Nabawi in Medina. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all tawfiq to perform the ziyarah of the shrine of the Holy Prophet in Medina al-Munawwara. There is a pillar in the mosque known as Ustuanat Abi Lubaba, the pillar of Abi Lubaba, Ustuanat al Tawbah. It's in the area known as Al Rawda, between the grave of the Holy Prophet of Islam and the member of the Holy Prophet. This is a part of Jannah, or because Sayyidatul Nisa, peace and blessings be upon her, is buried there. There are a number of reasons. Yet this story is a story of what? Of unfortunate treachery or treason of this man by the name of Abu Lubaba. Because Bani Nadir were there, were in Medina. The Prophet of Islam sends them Sa'ad ibn Ma'ad. He says to them, because you have betrayed, you must now submit. They looked at the person who is the messenger of the Prophet. He was Abu Lubaba. So Abu Lubaba was a friend of theirs from Jahiliyyah. So they looked at him and said, what happens if we don't submit? So Abu Lubaba does this, whereas he was not supposed to tell them that the Prophet will attack them. It was a secret. He later realized that he has divulged the secret. He came back, he wrapped himself around the pillar, story well known, most of you know it, said, I will not leave until Allah forgives me and the Prophet forgives me. And when Allah forgave him, the ayah was revealed, خُذْ مِنْ أَمْوَالِهِمْ صَدَقَةُ طَهِرُ He said, no, no, this is fine, Allah has forgiven me, but I have, the Prophet has to come and untie me. And the Prophet of Islam came and untied him. Now, what is interesting here is the first degree is what? When I go against clear instructions of Allah and His Messenger. When I start to develop my own version of Islam. Please understand this. In my world, in my aql, I start to believe and fight and advocate that, for example, khums is not wajib. Or I start to say there is no evidence for hijab being obligatory. Or start to doubt the pin pinnacle and the pillars of Islam. And say, you know what? This is wrong. Not when I am going through a journey of discovery or I have doubt. That's different. When I am asking questions, when I am unsure. No, I stand firm. I am defiant. I am arrogantly rejecting principles that exist within the religion of Islam. Yes? It's an interesting story that Sheikh al-Saduq narrates that once... The community of Fir'aun came to him and said to him, you claim to be our God. We have a problem because the rivers have dried up and our farms are suffering. So please make the rivers flow with water because you are God, they said to him. He said, go away. They came back afterwards to him. 
They said, our animals are dying. We cannot survive anymore. Now we are doubting whether you are truly God or not. He said, fine. Go up to a particular cliff and I will make it happen. Yes. So according to this riwayah, he came, he placed his face on the ground and raised his index finger to the sky, to the heaven and said, Ya Allah, you are the Lord, not me. If I ask you please to help me in this situation and you know, I am at the moment in a desperate state. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answered his dua and the rivers flew. The moment the rivers flew, they came and did sajda to him and he said, yes, I am your God. So Jibra'il came to him in the form of a person, human being. He said to him, O oh, Fir'aun, I have a problem I need you to solve. He said, what is your problem? He said, I have a slave. I gave him the keys and all of my treasures. And now he has used it against me. What do I do? Fir'aun said, he deserves to be what? Drowned in the sea. He said, can you write this for me? So Fir'aun writes it. This slave deserves to be drowning in the sea. Signed, Fir'aun gives it to him. The Riwayah says, yes, that when he was drowning, Jibrail came to him and said, do you recognize this? Here, this was your own, your own damnation. You are the slave of Allah. You went against his command. That's the first level of khianat. Yet, yet, what the manifestation of this unfortunately sometimes is, the hidden betrayal. What is the hidden betrayal? And that is when it comes to our social relationships. Human beings have a number of interesting relationships as sociable beings. We speak with people. We travel with individuals. We sit together as family, as gatherings. Therefore, a lot of conversations take place. And at the same time, when a lot of conversations take place, there are sometimes things that are said in these gatherings. In these settings, yes? For example, our ulama call it al-majalis bil khiyana. There's a term, yes, that is referred to in Islamic jurisprudence, and that is betrayal in social gatherings and relationships. Please understand this. Very critical because it applies to each and every one of us with no exception. What is this? Even we have found that today there is a chapter in Al-Kafi. Allah Ta'ala Maqam al-Shaykh al-Kulayni has put an entire chapter on this area, which is called Majalis al-Amanat, the trust in gatherings. Yes, perhaps if he knew the term Baraza, he would have used it. Yes, in the recognition that sometimes when we are sitting, what do we have? We have conversations. People say things. People disclose things. Sometimes you and I are levy to information that others don't have. An alim is approached by an individual who wants a solution to their khums problem. So the alim knows how much money they have. Or is dealing with an inheritance issue. So is very well aware of the finances. A pharmacist is visited by someone from the community. The pharmacist knows what kind of medication that particular individual takes. A doctor who signs confidentiality clauses anyway. Others in the community on a position of leadership. People who are approached by others because they need help. They need assistance, for example. Or, or innocently in conversations that take place in particular what gatherings that people sometimes divulge certain matters regarding their life their past or you know when you travel with somebody sometimes they open up to you they say things to you which they may not say when you're in mosque for example these in sharia are all known as amana trust and these must not be divulged to anyone without the permission of the individual and this is specifically mentioned in our fuqaha Ulama's works based on the narrations of the Ahlul Bayt. For example, the Prophet of Islam came for, comes forward and says, there are these amanat that are there and must not be divulged except for three reasons. One, due to damin haram, to save somebody being, for who's being killed or blood has been shed, which is wrongly. Or because of an accusation regarding a relationship, physical relationship. Or because of wealth issues, dispute, Due to wealth, malin min ghayri dhi haq. 
other than these, if there are these conversations and discussions that take place, we must be very careful because, you know, the problem with us is unless somebody tells us, by the way, what I said to you was confidential. And even then, sometimes some of us go and say someone else, by the way, I was told it's confidential, but I'll tell you anyway. This happens, yes? But it doesn't need the individual to say it's confidential. That statement the person said in front of you in baraza or gathering may be related to themselves, may be related to their parents, may be related to an experience that they have got. It should not be divulged to others without their permission. Tough one. But what makes it tougher is the world of social media and especially what's going on on WhatsApp. Because this area, no doubt, is going to shake some people. What's happening? Screenshots, forwards of messages, voice notes being forwarded. Allahu Akbar, loudspeaker. I'm speaking to someone, answering their question, whatever. They say, Mawlana, by the way, I'm on a loudspeaker. Five people are listening. Ajib. When you put someone on a loudspeaker, you must tell them. This is not a joke. There is an amanat in the conversation that takes place. When I am sending someone a message or having an answer to somebody or having a conversation with somebody, there are rulings relating to this by our maraja today that I will now narrate to you. Ayatullah Sistani Hafizahullah was asked, can I forward a message that somebody has sent me specifically to someone else? You are ready for the answer? He says it's permissible provided it does not disclose a secret or harms that individual. Three other maraja I have found. Ayatullah Sayyid Mudarrasi, Ayatullah Bashir Najafi, and Ayatullah Sadiq Shirazi. I have their fatwa, anyone wants to see it. They said it's haram to forward the message. Without the permission. No, no conditions. They say you have to ask for that person's permission. A message that they sent you on WhatsApp, on Instagram, on any particular place. If that particular individual, whatever they have said, according to these maraja, according to Agasistani, you need to be able to think, is this going to harm them in any way? Is this going to be divulging a secret that they have or not? That's why Imam Ja'far ibn Muhammad al-Sadiq sallallahu wa sallam When he says, Imtahinu Shi'atana inda thalath, test our Shia in three places. We mentioned one of them two nights ago. What was it? Who was paying attention? What about prayers? On time. Ahsan. Finally. In the idea that Imam says a sign of the Shia is that they pray on time. Another one he says what? He says, Hufdahum or Hifdi Asrarihim. How they protect the secrets between themselves and our secrets from our enemies. This is very important. There is a khiyana betrayal happening by some of us when we divulge things which should not be divulged on social media that have been said by the Ahlul Bayt. So what does that mean? Should I say everything? No, who told you you should say everything? Because sometimes saying some things without explaining can make a lot of damage. Sometimes some of these narrations of the Ahl al-Bayt are very specific and need to be explained. And then not for the general masses. I remember one of the ulama said, I was explaining to a non-Muslim what's wrong with Yazid. He said, oh... Because a Shia at work said to me when I asked him, why do you do Muharram and everything and commemoration? He said, yes, because there was a man by the name of Hussein. He rose against a man by the name of Yazid. When I asked him, a non-Muslim said, I asked him, what's wrong with Yazid? He said, oh, Yazid, terrible man. He said, what did he do? He said, he used to drink alcohol and have many women. So he said, a non-Muslim, I said, you know what? I'm like him, you know. <laughs> I'm similar. 
in the recognition? Do we have the intelligence and the depth to be smart, emotionally intelligent too? When we speak to non-Muslims, when we present a hadith of Ali Muhammad, Allahu Akbar, this is rush. Mawlana, let us just spread these ahadith for the God's sake, just without references, without anything. Yes, these inspirational ones, the ones get you closer to Allah, no problem. But there are some secrets of Ali Muhammad. There are some things which should not be just like this. Ask Alim, Mulana, I have this. Is this. Does it need quantifying? Does this need explanation or not? This free fall is not necessarily a good thing. Number one. Number two, what else happens in certain situations when there are divorces? There is khiyana. What do we mean? The social khiyana happens where? When, for example, the husband goes and destroys the reputation of his ex-wife. And the ex-wife goes and divulges all the secrets of her ex-husband. Why? I want to feel good so that everyone says, oh, I know why I got divorced. Someone once came to a person who's about to get divorced from the community, and a particular community, and said, why are you getting divorced? He said, I can't say. He said, why? He said, she's still my wife. After a few months, you know, some people, they are gossip machines. They are, you know, propaganda they want to go and find this information so he came back to this person and said now that you're divorced please tell me why you divorced he said now she's a sister in islam i can't say anything about her do we have that mentality or no maulana sit down let me give you the files let me explain to you how this person did this and this person did this and this person did this there is a difference if someone comes to you and wants to marry them and says, please tell me because that's marriage. Other than that, there is no justification for destroying their reputation and character assassination of a particular... This is khiyana. For example, another demonstration our ulama have said, if I am have a tawfiq to wash a body of a mu'min as a male or one of the ladies, the mu'mina, I have amana to make sure when I leave, somebody asks me, how is the body? I can't say. I can't say. Oh, it was torn into pieces and his head was this. No, 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 no. This is a trust you have been given. This is a secret that must not be divulged. It is not for me to go and tell the world what has been hidden. Who has given us permission to make public announcements that which we have been yes, granted by others? That's why it's of the utmost importance today that we look at this with a very clear objective to refine the way we what we channel or pass information between ourselves. We have to be careful. We have to be extra dutiful as far as our obligations in society, as far as the social elements are concerned. Information that is given to us this could be pivotal in damaging the lives of others, in destroying the reputation of others, especially when it comes to our conduct on social media. Sometimes we think that the akhlaq online is different to the akhlaq offline. But many a times that the green light that's given, unfortunately, when it comes to off online does not particularly exist. And by the way, there are also other demonstrations of khiyana, which I am not focusing on. Betrayal when it comes to marital relationships, when, for example, one of the, either the husband or the wife, has illicit haram relationships outside the marriage. That's betrayal. No doubt, that's khiyana that's condemned in the Quran. When Allah says, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu la takhunu Allah wa rasul wa takhunu amanatakum. Allah says, number one, do not betray Allah and the Messenger. Okay, we've understood that. But then he says, don't betray your amana, your trust. You have been given with something. Never, what? Never commit that treason. What is that amana? Sometimes we hear of, unfortunately, these cases that happen within our communities when, for example, a group of people or two individuals have an agreement and one of them runs away with the money or takes out a loan and then refuses to give it back. Financial treason or betrayal is another sad realization that is happening out there and it's heavily condemned. And the month of Ramadan is a month in which you and I are invited by Allah as his guest. Do you agree? 
وَجُعِلْتُمْ مِنْ أَهْلِ كَرَامَةِ الله. الله says, not only are you my guests, you are my VIP guests. You are my special guests. Now, if in this month of Ramadan we are the guests of Allah, surely we should be seeking to do that which He loves and staying away from that which He dislikes. And specifically, Allah has said, I don't like this khiyana. إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُحِبُّ الْخَائِنِينَ I don't like this khiyana. In the month of Ramadan, I need to work harder to refine the way I think and the way I speak and the way I communicate and the way I spread information. And scrutinize myself, train my youngsters, children and the youth, my family to be God-centric and God-conscious in how they speak and how they relate information that is given to them. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us tawfiq in this regard to be of those who stay away from all forms of khiyana, betrayal, social and otherwise. Final point, and that is with regards to one of the mu'mineen yesterday asked me to speak about this and that is those mu'mineen and mu'minat who are excused from fasting. Sisters who are going through the time of the month, the period, the menstrual time, and they are not fasting. What should they do when it comes to eating and drinking? So of course, I, this is not what I spoke about yesterday, which is somebody who is fasting and breaks the fast. If somebody is fasting and breaks the fast, then ihtiyat wujubi, they must remain fasting afterwards if they had to drink a little bit of water, just sufficient for them to stay alive, as we said yesterday. However, if somebody, for example, is elderly, or somebody, for instance, is a female who cannot fast due to this particular reason. What is the situation here? Well, they are allowed at the first level to eat. However, ulama say there is a hurma, sanctity to shahar Ramadan. Hurmat shahar Ramadan. They say it's haram, hatkil hurma, to violate the sanctity. Today, today, I saw, I'm not going to mention in some parts, yes, in, 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 the, in this region, I was walking past and there are some ladies wearing hijab, mashallah. Now, is this haram? Potentially. Potentially. I saw an answer from his eminence that said, what about somebody who has a valid excuse for breaking the fast? Can they eat in public? The answer is this. If they're evidently an individual who can't fast, like an elderly individual, then yes. In public, maybe. But if it, and people can't figure out why they're not, they're not fasting, then it could potentially be hatkil hurma, the violation of the sanctity of Shahar Ramadan. So please, my humble advice to my sisters and brothers, especially the sisters, because they may go through it more than the brothers, if you are not fasting, then do not eat in public in the month of Ramadan. Oh, but Maulana, when in London, not Karachi, we're not in Najaf and Karbala and Mashhad. Doesn't matter. There is a hurma to Shahar Ramadan. Shahar Ramadan, publicly, you are wearing a hijab. Yes? This public consumption of food should not take place. I'm not saying blanket it is haram, but you are on a borderline. And if it is subjectively proven that you are violating the sanctity of the month, then it could be problematic. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to protect the sanctity of Shahar Ramadan with the barak of salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليك يا رسول الله السلام عليك يا أمير المؤمنين السلام عليك يا فاطمة الزحراء سيدة النساء العالمين السلام عليك يا خديجة الكبرى 
السلام عليك يا حسن المجتبى السلام عليك يا أبا عبد الله الحسين وعلى تسعة المعصومين من ذريتك علي بن الحسين ومحمد بن علي وجعفر بن محمد وموسى بن جعفر وعلي بن موسى ومحمد بن علي وعلي بن محمد والحسن بن علي والحجة بن الحسن عجل الله فرجه وصحل الله محرجه وظهوره والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم كل وليك الحجة بن الحسن صلواتك عليه وعلى أبائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا وذليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضك توعا Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Mumineen, one final announcement. May I have your attention, please? Tea and tabarruk will not be served if we are all not seated. Please, let us be seated. Ya Shabab. Brothers, you're kindly requested to be seated. Tafadhal, please be seated, gents. Bayo, brothers, kindly be seated, please. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Allahumma salli Allahumma.